Jim, what branch of the service were you in? I was in the Air Force. And where did you serve? Uh, well, I had training in the United States, and then I had two combat tours in Vietnam, essentially in Vietnam, and then I had uh, about four years at a, in Phoenix, in the Phoenix area, Chandler, Arizona, flying the F-5. Were you drafted, or did you enlist in the Air Force? Well, you couldn't I... Couldn't in the Air Force, sorry. No, nope, couldn't be drafted into the Air Force. I uh, joined uh, ROTC, uh, Air Force ROTC, when I was in uh, college in order to avoid the Army. Uh, which college did you attend? Uh, Colorado State University. Where were you living at that time? Were you living in Colorado? Yeah, I grew up in Colorado, or finished growing up in Colorado. My father was a naval officer, happened to be stationed in Colorado when he was killed. So we, I finished my grade school and high school years in Colorado, and then went to Colorado State University. And your father was also an aviator, right? He was, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about him? I can. He graduated from the University of New Mexico in uh, 1936, also as an ROTC guy, but in the Naval ROTC program. He went to Pensacola and learned to fly. Spent four years flying for the Navy, but in those years, pre-war, um, if you hadn't graduated from Annapolis, you were not eligible for a commission. So he flew as a grade rank of aviation cadet, but was never eligible for a uh, commission. So at the end of his uh, obligation time, four years, he got out in 1940. Uh, and went to work for what has become the FAA. In those days, it was a Civil Aeronautics Board. It wasn't very long into 1940 that people in Washington thought they might need some pilots. And uh, so they asked him to come back and offered him a commission, and he served uh, in the United States Navy as a aviator through World War II. Um, and uh, was asked to stay on instead of being uh, subject to the reduction in force that most of the people experienced after World War II. He was asked to stay on. By that time, he had reached the rank of commander in the, in the Navy. That's 05. Um, and uh, he did not lose that rank. He kept that rank until he was promoted to captain in 56. Um, so he served in the Navy as an aviator from, essentially, from 1936 to 56. But he really only had 17 years of service because they didn't count on the thing um, having to do with um, this aviation cadet time. He was a career naval aviator. He was, uh-huh. And um, so he was a carrier pilot, but he flew most of the war at the Dal Dallas Naval Air Training Station and town in Brownsville, uh, training people uh, to fly to the Navy. Uh, and didn't go to sea, actually, until, I think, January of 1944. So he was at sea for just about, oh, 20 months or so, from January 44 to August of 45. And what was your father's name? I forgot to ask you. His name was James Joseph Richardson. Um, so, why did you pick the Air Force? Well, my father was, on, I was only 12 when my father died, but I did remember that he said to me, if you ever want to fly in the service, fly in the Air Force. And I didn't understand that, but because I thought this Navy flying thing was pretty good. He told me that in the Navy, the ship managers, the people who run the ships, are the first-class citizens, and the people who fly the airplanes are second-class citizens. In the Air Force, the opposite is true. Yeah, pilots are driving, are running the show, and so if you're going to fly, you might as well fly in the Air Force and be a first-class citizen. And the equipment is just as good. Can you recall the first days 
when you do the service? My first days? Mm -hmm. Well, my first year was pilot training. It takes a whole year. And so, sure, I can recall showing up on base and experiencing my first ice storm. I grew up in Colorado, and it snows in Colorado. Went to a flight training in Oklahoma, and it rains ice in Oklahoma. Freezes on contact. We have that around here some, but I had never seen uh, it. I remember trying to get off my windshield. Never forget it. First time. Anyway, showed up in Oklahoma in December of 1967 and left in December of 68. Uh, learned to fly in the uh, at the time T41 and T37 and T38 trainers. Uh, and uh, when I left pilot training, I was assigned to the F4. Wait, go ahead. Can you remember any of your instructors that made an impression on you in that time? Yeah, yeah, a couple. Um, I'll never forget my first solo flight in the T37, which is a very small twin engine jet trainer, subsonic jet trainer. You have to solo in X number of flights or hours. And in my view, I had never successfully landed the airplane when it came up for my last chance at solo. So I thought that was going to be my last Air Force pilot ride. But we went out to this auxiliary field and this guy flew me around. Gary Householder was his name. And we did three touch and goes, and, or two touch and goes, and he, on the last one he said, okay, stop. And he got out of the airplane and told me to fly around the pattern three more times and come back and pick him up. I got up there and got out on what we call downwind, which is a position that you fly in order to approach the aircraft or the uh, airport. And I was, uh, I was thinking to myself, I'll still never forget the thought, okay, Jim, you've now got yourself in a position you cannot get out of. Because I did not think I could land that airplane. But I did successfully pretty well three times. And so then we went on and I learned to uh, fly airplanes. Well. That instructor knew you could land it. He did, yeah. I did. I <laughs> and then in the T-38 and the supersonic trainer, I had a, a Canadian instructor from the Canadian Air Force. And he was a wonderful guy, very humorous. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can't remember his name, but I'll never forget who he was and how much fun it was to fly with him. Um, what was the fun of flying with him versus other people? Oh, yeah, I don't know. I was the only guy I flew with. Oh, okay. So, um, he, was, he was just a great guy, and I liked flying with him. He wasn't the only guy I flew with. We flew occasionally with other instructors, but um, he was my instructor. So I graduated from there in December of 68 and went through a, just about eight months of training uh, to be ready to go to Vietnam. Went to radar school and went through survival training and then water survival and then I went through the uh, pilot portion of the, the flying portion of it. Finished all that in October. And they wanted somebody to fly some, or be part of a flight of delivery aircraft to Europe. And so I flew some, um, flew an airplane to Schusterberg Airport Air Base in uh, the Netherlands, and uh, came home and pretty quick was on my way to Vietnam. What was survival training like? Um, water survival was pleasant. Uh, the other survival, uh, turns out, was at a place called Fairchild Air Force Base in Spokane, Washington. It was in January, and it was freezing cold. Freezing cold. And it also in, involved POW training. So they would 
treat you like a POW for about three days. And that was really hard. Uh, they introduced you to this thing called torture and told you to give name, rank, and serial number and nothing else and demonstrated how difficult that might be over an extended, extended period of time. And then we went out in the woods and survived for a week. And it was snowed every day. There was three feet of snow when we got there. It snowed every day we were there. A group of five people trying to survive, and eat, and of course there was no food. Uh, so it was hard. They did give us, they, <laughs> they brought us a captured rabbit, uh, which was our sole source of food for five people for five days. But it was something. <laughs> And then, uh, just before we went to uh, Vietnam, or on the way to Vietnam, we stopped at Clark Air Brakes in the Philippines and had a week of what they call jungle survival. It was entirely different and much more appropriate. Teach you how to get out of a tree if your parachute is hung up. Teach you how to eat, live in the jungle, if you're lucky enough to be a whole in one piece when you're get there. And that worked for some folks. They actually did survive for some extended period of time and get themselves rescued. So uh, then I went to Da Nang, was, um, was with this group they called the Gunfighters. That was the 366th Tactical Fighter Wing. And primary, uh, it had really two primary missions. That was uh, support of ground troops in Vietnam, in the northern sectors of Vietnam. Da Nang is very close to the DMZ. And uh, then the other, because we were close to the DMZ, was the introduction uh, that went on in Laos, uh, which was to destroy air, airplanes or traffic on what we called the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was the, uh, there's no such thing as the Ho Chi Minh Trail, but it, there is a thing, a series of route structures by which the Vietnamese would move munitions from the north to the south. And our job was to destroy that, keep them from getting those munitions and re, you know, resupply people and munitions. How large was your unit that you were assigned to there? Uh, a squadron typically has somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 airplanes, no wing. They have three or four squadrons, so we could have 80 or 100 airplanes in a wing. Uh, probably it's going to be 75, 60, 75 airplanes in a wing divided among the squadrons. Um, I cannot remember how many squadrons we had at um, Tanang. You know, we had four at Ubon. Uh, and then we had, uh, there was this need to identify targets of opportunity. Uh, and in order to do that, we would fly very low level uh, missions looking for targets of opportunities in high threat areas. We would fly low and fast so that we couldn't be uh, easily targeted. Um, it's very hard to shoot a SAM, uh, SA-2, at a low altitude aircraft. It's designed to shoot at a high altitude aircraft. And this SA-7 shoulder-fired surface-to-air missile wasn't, was still in development. They started using them in uh, mid-1972, maybe, maybe as early as mid-1971. But I didn't encounter any uh, shoulder-fired SAMs. Um, so the, their munitions that they would use to, to shoot at us were 23, 37, and 57 caliber uh, machine guns or anti-aircraft guns. Uh, and 57 quad mine, 57, which is four 57 uh, millimeter cannons firing 
in sequence. Um, it just looks like a fire hose. It's unbelievable the amount of uh, of um, shells that can come out of that. And the 37 and the 23. The 23 was the most common uh, anti-aircraft, and usually it was just one, one barrel. Uh, That's a 23 millimeter. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think yeah, they were 23 millimeter uh, cannons, uh, and. Uh, the E model F4 had a 20 millimeter cannon in it, well, at 600 rounds, and they fire uh, at 6,000 rounds a minute. The E model is what? To me, a ammunition? Did, did I say E model? Yes. I meant ammo. Oh, okay. okay, sorry. We had 600 rounds of uh, ammunition, but that's only 10 seconds firing time. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I say that because there's not a lot of difference between a 20 millimeter and a 23 millimeter. The good thing about the 23 uh, is, is that they, every third round or every fourth round it was a trace shot. Yeah, at night you could. At the daytime you, you wouldn't see it um, unless it was very close. Uh, you would see them. Uh, only when they were very close. 37s, we couldn't really tell the difference between a 23 and a 37. It was bigger, but we wouldn't know uh, when we're flying past it or it's flying past you. You can't tell the difference. What would you do when you saw this coming at you? Or well, it's a, to avoid the... a, a rifle shot or a cannon shot is a ballistic mm -hmm. missile. It's not guided. Right. If you know where it's coming from, they can't possibly hit you mm -hmm. because you're flying a very maneuverable airplane. Right. The, the people who are going to get hit are the ones you don't see. Um, and so people did get hit when they were shot by people who had, we, when we didn't see them. It didn't happen a lot if, uh, uh, if our visual reconnaissance was any good, and it was very good. So there were visual reconnaissance teams flying from Ubon, and they called themselves the Wolf Pack because the name of their, their wing was the Wolf Pack. And they had them out of Udorn, and I don't remember what they called themselves. And we had them from Diné. Um, and then, at, at, also at Ubon, we had this night squadron that flew this same kind of mission at night a little differently because we used flares and different kind of markers so that people could see things on the ground. You mentioned the linebacker one, linebacker two campaigns you were involved in. Can you describe what they were? I really can't. I can describe that missions, mm -hmm. but I couldn't tell the difference between uh, missions that were part of all this linebacker campaign and missions that were not. Um, I, that's terminology I've heard, and I'm often asked if I was part of it. And I think I was, because I remember hearing that a lot while I was there. But I didn't know the difference. Uh, when we would go to a target, we'd go to a target, and we'd hit it. Um, now, on your missions, how often would you be involved in destroying something, or not just looking? Um, or if you found something, would you engage? No, because we didn't have anything to engage with. Okay. We were, our job was to locate, identify the targets. We didn't have the attack munitions on board to attack it. But there were always fighters available with attack munitions. So when we would find something that, that was a valid that target, we would get fighters immediately and destroy it by showing it to the fighters. And we'd do that with a rocket, a smoke rocket, or at night with a uh, flare and a uh, piece of magnesium. We'd use a magnesium bomb, put it on the ground, it would burn. And that would be a reference point from which somebody could uh, drop their bombs. Got to remember. Uh, it's really hard 
for somebody to contemplate how dark night is when there are no lights. No lights. That's, nobody in the United States has ever witnessed that because there are no places in the United States that have absolutely no light. Uh, that, that's probably not true. There are probably some vast areas in uh, parts of Oregon and Colorado, the mountains in Wyoming, where there are very few lights. Uh, but we're talking about no light. So the only light is moonlight, and on an overcast night, there's no moon. Uh, so there's very little uh, uh, reference, light reference, which is very dangerous for an uh, aircraft because knowing where the ground is as opposed to the sky is really important. So how did you fly at night then, to know where the ground was? Well, you, you use your instruments, yeah, and you believe your instruments, and you fly on instruments, and you know where you're going, because you've been there before. And we did have radio navigation aids, things called TACANs, uh, and we had uh, what we thought in 1968 was a very sophisticated piece of material called an inertia navigation system, which was that. It was a bunch of gimbals that spun at high speed and told you where you were. Old-fashioned GPS? Or? Well, a GPS is much, much, much more accurate, right. but this was a, a way of navigating uh, without using external sources. And it worked pretty well. Now, you had two people in the airplane and one was responsible for knowing where you were at all the time. And the other one was responsible for making sure you stayed alive. Are there any navigators that come into your mind that you had with you? Or what did you call those? That seat in your plane? Well, we called it the back seat, mm -hmm. and uh, for a long time uh, there were pilots in the back seat. But in beginning in 1971-ish, they stopped using pilots in the back seat and put navigators back there, because they were just as effective uh, for that job. They didn't actually have to know how to fly the airplane. Most of them learned how to fly it anyhow, because there was a stick back there and throttles and rudder, and they could learn to fly. And did, but uh, they weren't certified, qualified pilots. Uh, but they were weapon systems operators, and they operated the weapon systems and uh, reset circuit breakers that popped. We had a lot of systems, and I bet you we had as many as a hundred circuit breakers lining the panels in the back seat. And if one of them popped because of overload or something, uh, you could reset it and it might not pop again. It might. That would tell you you had a different kind of a problem. Um, and then the, the front seat guy had all the warning lights, but no circuit breakers. You mentioned some memorials, uh, uh, missions that you remember. Can you go through the three that you mentioned before? You know, the uh, well, search and rescue. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, so we didn't do that on camera the first time? No. Okay. Uh, one night I was uh, functioning as an instructor pilot. Uh, yeah, I, but for some reason I was in the front seat. But I had a qualified pilot in my back seat. Um, and I... I guess I was showing him uh, how to do what we call gunship escort uh, escorts, but we were on this gunship escort mission, and uh, uh, I watched some SAMs get launched just over the border in North Vietnam, and uh, I kidded with my friend in the back that somebody was getting their eyes watered, and they were. Um, the thing is, one SAM is really hard to de defeat. If they shoot two at you, uh, the second one's going to come at you while you're in your defeat maneuver, and it's much more difficult to defeat it. 
Um, so uh, they did get this airplane. So we went over to the target area and tried to pick up their uh, radios, see if they had survived the jump. Uh, and they had. Uh, we heard them before they, they before the parachutes got to the ground, they were able to talk. So we knew both of them got out of the airplane alive. Um, but we never heard from them again. We searched the area, but the munitions I had were anti-personnel, anti-gun munitions. I'm not going to drop. I can't, couldn't drop that. Uh, so I had a lot of weight and drag slowing me down and using up gas. and. Uh, but I was on scene, and uh, the uh, we had these people that uh, flew in uh, what they call AWACS now, uh, and they uh, supervised the war effort at, or segments of the war effort. Anyway, our command control um, designated me as the on scene commander, and we had a lot of fighters in the area, but we couldn't do anything with them uh, because. We couldn't identify whether our guys made it to the ground alive and whether they'd been captured. So all we could do was give them messages that they might be able to hear. Problem is, if they had the radio on, the radio on so that they could hear the message, then other people could hear it too. And that would identify their position and they would certainly be captured. I don't know how long it took them to be captured, but uh, they were captured. We were told to tell them that they had to get themselves to the ocean if they wanted any chance of being picked up. How far from the ocean were they? No, oh, 20 miles, maybe, maybe a little more. And, and they weren't—they were in hilly jungle territory when they went down, but what they had between them and the ocean was flat rice fields. There was no way they were going to make that in open terrain without being spotted. So I just didn't have any chance. You also mentioned your uh, roommate. Yeah. He flew uh, one of these owl fat uh, missions. Uh, and uh, he, he flew uh, just after me. And uh, so I was on the ground. Um, and. Uh, in the bar, and some friends came in and said he was overdue. So I waited up as long as I could and finally went to bed. And about nine o'clock in the morning, the squadron commander came and asked me to go look for him, the wreckage, see if I could uh, find a wreckage. So I did, and um, didn't find it for four and a half, five hours later got me all the fuel I could use in a very light airplane, no munitions. Um, but we couldn't find any evidence of wreckage. We don't know if he flew into the ground or if he was shot out of the air, what happened. He was, it took him about five years, but about five years later they listed him as KIA instead of MIA. And then the uh, other memorable mission for me, the most memorable, was the first time we escorted these bombers on what we call arc light strikes. That's these flights of heavy B-52 bombers with lots of 500-pound bombs, carpet bombing. And uh, mostly, we'd seen a lot of that. I'd seen a lot of that in South Vietnam. But I'd never seen it in North Vietnam because of the threat. Uh, so our mission that night was they had produced these new, uh, what we call pods, uh, ECM pods or electronic countermeasure pods uh, that were actually supposed to blank radar scopes so that they couldn't see you. Um, and then our mission was then to fly at uh, high enough altitude that we could drop these bundles of chaff in front of the bombers so that when they came through, there would be no radar signature because the 
sky would just be full of all these little pieces of aluminum uh, reflecting the uh, radar, and so it just looked like a white screen. And it worked. The thing is, we had to fly with our afterburners lit at night, making ourselves wonderful targets. Because the airplane, without afterburner, wasn't capable of flying at this altitude with these emissions. And we couldn't maneuver because our job was to put this chaff out in a nice, even pattern. So there we were. The first three flights, I was leading the fourth flight through, and the first three flights went through without incident. And then by the time uh, my flight came through, all the folks on the ground had been awakened and aroused and manned the SAM stations. And we got a lot of SAMs, maybe half a dozen, maybe a dozen SAMs. It was a, an exciting ride. But, and one of them went off really close but above, just barely at the same altitude, maybe just above us. And I thought we had lost number four, but we hadn't. Went off just above him, and I could see his airplane light up, but he didn't. Uh, you mentioned to me before that uh, your airplane had been shot up a few times, and you had over how many missions did you have over Vietnam? I had 454. Is that a record number? I don't think so. No. I don't know what a record, what the record is. It's high. Yeah. There weren't a, very many people that had a typical, uh, a typical tour uh, when you were flying when they were flying to North Vietnam was a hundred missions. It took about seven months, six seven months. Um, the other limitation on a tour was a year. People were only asked to stay there for a year. Uh, and it was, if you were flying in South Vietnam or in Laos, uh, the probability is that you'd fly somewhere in the neighborhood of 200, maybe 210 missions in that time. You flew almost every day, not quite every day, even though there are 365 days in a year. There are no days off. There are times when they send you out of the zone for a week for what they call R&R, &R, rest and recuperation. Where would you go? Uh, well, they had a lot of nice places you could go. You could go to Sydney, you could go to Bangkok, you could go to Hong Kong. Um, but the idea was just to get you out of the target area for a while. Uh, so anyway, 220, 225 missions was about the limit. Um, so I had two tours and totaled right at five, 454 missions. And you told me that you had received some damage on your plane. Yeah. A few times. Four times. Can you explain those, please? Small arms fire. Mm -hmm. um, the only really dangerous one. Um, the one, first one that got my attention was uh, taking off on New Year's Eve. Uh, in 1970, January 1, 1970. It was on my second or third mission. I, my first mission was Christmas Day during the bombing haul, which is always a joke because there is no such thing as a bombing haul. Uh, but this was early on, and uh, I, we noticed uh, that the generator, one of the generators, dropped offline just as we were clearing the field. Didn't think much of it because we tried to reset it, reset fine, operated, and everything was fine. We came back and there was a bullet in it. So somebody got us. We don't know whether it was some Marine celebrating New Year's because we took off, our takeoff time was midnight. It was just shooting in the sky, or whether it was some Vietnamese shooting at us. We just don't know. Have no idea. Were you at Da Nang then? I was at Da Nang, yeah. So you, before you even took off, you got generated. No, we were clearing the field. Oh, okay. Just going over the fence. No, we, we were airborne. And then the other really exciting one was the small arms fire cut the afterburner spray, spray bars. 
and uh, we, we didn't know it, uh, and there would be no way to know it. But uh, and it wouldn't have any impact unless you tried to use your actuator. Uh, on this particular uh, flight at this particular time, we didn't try to use the afterburner for the rest of that particular flight. So we landed and went into the parking area and all of a sudden all these people that are usually there helping to get park the airplane and get out of it are not doing that. They're running the other way. And uh, so we figured out that there was some reason these people were afraid of our airplane. <laughs> So we shut it down and got out as fast as we could and discovered that it was just pouring gas, just kerosene everywhere. And that was because this afterburner spray bar had been cut and it just filled up with fuel and dumped all that fuel out on the ground. That would have been a very exciting ride if we had tried to use that afterburner. But we didn't. So. Some others, or four of them. I had four, and I don't remember. Okay. Uh, the back seat that you flew, men who flew with you, can you remember any of those people? How many did you have back there? No, I was in the back. The you first, were in the back. The first year, I was in the back. Okay. I was the radar operator, and I can remember some of the front seat guys. Yeah, I don't remember their names. I remember one lieutenant colonel um, that I really liked. But then he went away because he was lieutenant colonel, got promoted, went to Saigon, had to work at headquarters. He would come back occasionally and we would fly together. Um, and then uh, I flew most of my missions as this uh, stormy fact, high speed reconnaissance. But occasionally uh, some strike missions. And um, when the wing commander would fly, I got picked to fly with him. Usually that was just a transit flight down to Saigon because he had to go to some meeting or something like that. But that relationship worked out for me because when I came up for an assignment, he got me sent to the front seat, which was a nice thing, something I wanted to do. I know from my own military experience how important it was to have somebody up there was watching you all the time, and guiding you or telling you, please do this. And you believe them and it worked so hard for me. Yeah. Sometimes I uh, never met a uh, 06 or 07 that didn't deserve to be there. Now, there are probably some out there that don't, that didn't deserve to be there, but those guys are pretty sharp. The, the thing that we don't realize, or maybe we are now realizing it because of this. Iraq and Afghanistan conflict. It's the people who fight the wars are in their early or mid 20s. People who get hurt are young, very young people. Even the commanders are in their early 30s. Um, so these are people who fight wars are young people. They are not experienced people. They may be experienced at war, but they're not, they don't have a broad base of experience. And we are destroying a lot of wonderful human resources. That's true. You were awarded a lot of uh, two important medals over there. Could you describe those, the awards? Um, sure. The Distinguished Flying Crosses, they uh, are reserved for people who uh, demonstrate exceptional valor in some particular act, usually in, uh, at great risk to themselves uh, and, uh, and often at great risk to themselves in trying to successfully or unsuccessfully save somebody or a group of people. Um, now, the hypothesis was that if you survived for a whole year in Vietnam flying, you must have earned a Distinguished Flying Cross at one point. So everybody that 
got through that period of a year uh, was awarded one Distinguished Flying Cross when they left. Um, and the Air Medals were also for except, uh, extraordinarily, extraordinary performance in flight in combat uh, conditions. Um, and it was assumed that if uh, you survived 20 missions uh, in South Vietnam, you had earned one. So they gave you one um, for every 20 missions. Uh, now, if you flew those missions in North Vietnam, they gave you one for every 10 missions. And if you flew those missions in Laos, because of the threat, they gave you one for every 15 missions. They also counted the threat of flying these high-speed, low-level reconnaissance missions the same as flying in North Vietnam. So you'd earn one for uh, every 10 of those. So I turned up a total of 33 air medals and four distinguished flying crosses. Uh, the reason I got the extra distinguished flying crosses was a couple of missions that one of these leading bombers in, and then uh, I don't even remember which, where the other one came from. There are long documents upstairs in a file that will tell me which ones, but I, I don't have a connection to them. Can you describe flying one of these high-speed reconnaissance missions that you did? low-level missions, how it went, altitude, and speed? Well, I don't know how to describe it. You uh, fly uh, as fast as is practical, as low as practical, in uh, very high threat areas. Um, and it takes a long time. Uh, it doesn't take you long to get there because you're flying at altitude, but then you drop down and where you can see the ground up close. And what you're looking for is gun sites, uh, surface-to-air missile sites, and uh, uh, traffic. Uh, now, there's no train traffic. It's all truck. Uh, so you're looking for root structures. Uh, now, if you're in North Vietnam, it's very heavily uh, foliage. And in South Vietnam, in Laos, we bombed it flat. There was just no trees left. So it was pretty easy to see the ground. Um, and uh, occasionally, uh, there, and there were some airports in Laos, uh, occasionally you'd find an airplane on one and destroy it. And we, we'd always fly over. If there was an airport close, we'd just fly by and make sure there was nothing there. Um, and almost, uh, I can only remember one occasion when there was something there. Uh, but you would just fly these root structures and these uh, mountain passes, uh, which were very dangerous mountain passes, dangerous because of the terrain and uh, dangerous because of the uh, air defenses. Because they wanted to get those trucks through. Uh, and there were very few places. There were just two places, uh, primary root structures. One was, we called it Bankarai Pass, and the other was Gugia Pass. Uh, I can't spell those, but uh, they were just very steep mountain passes with very small roads. And of course, we bombed the roads every day, make sure there were holes in them. And they'd come out at night, fill in the holes, and drive. It was amazing, the ingenuity. You knock down a bridge, they put it up overnight. It was unbelievable. They uh, worked really hard at their war. Now, most of these missions were at night. Well, my second tour was mostly at night. Probably 85% of my missions in the second tour was at night. And probably 85% of my missions in the first tour was in the daylight. Uh, but I was designated, or I flew this squadron with the squadron that was designated for night flying. And that was a good thing, because you get used to that cycle of rest sleeping in the day when, you know, you paint your windows black so that it's dark in your room, no matter what's going on outside. And um, uh, you uh, get used to sleeping on this different cycle. Uh, so very seldom awake in the sunlight. Uh, and get used to the noise on a base, all the jet noise. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you don't hear it. 
not not uh, after after a little while, you don't hear it. You hear it at first. Were you all involved in planning missions at all? No. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's not it, not completely true. Occasionally, uh, we'd have conversations about mission planning, um, but. Uh, and I was occasionally asked to be engaged in, in that with some people, but not often. During this time, how did you stay in touch with your parents? Uh, paper and pen. That was a, a telephone call to the United States. It was possible. The first three minutes was twelve dollars, okay. and when your salary is four hundred dollars a month, twelve dollars is a lot of money. <laughs> so there was no special line to the United States? No. Now there is. There was. There was this... Viacom or something? Yeah. I can't remember what we called it. It started with a T, but I did get a call on that line once from the United States, from the woman that was married to my roommate. And the only person who had a phone was the squadron commander, so the call came into him. I happened to be in the squad, and she was calling in the daylight, but of course, we're 12 hours out of sync. So it came in at night. Um, we were in the squadron, and he, she had asked for me, because he had written her that if he ever went missing, I, she should contact me, and I would tell her the truth, which I was entirely prepared to do, but I didn't know the truth. Uh, and that's all I could tell her. Were there a lot of casualties in the unit? Or you were you about eight years over there? No, no, I had two years. Okay. I was going to say two years. Okay. And um, we lost, strange, we lost one on Thanksgiving, my roommate, and we lost another one on Christmas, 1971. Both of those in 1971. We lost three of them in. Uh, my first year in 1970. One of them was a friend, actually the commander of our um, Storm and Fact unit, hit in the head. Um, one of the interesting pieces of battle damage, we had a guy who's in the back seat, there's an instrument that sits right in front of your well, right here. The chest is here. There's this instrument. It's a what we call a, a directional indicator. And a piece of bullet stopped right in that instrument. Hmm. Came back, he came into the airplane and stopped right there. <laughs> um, but I don't know. What was the food like where you were, and how did you eat? Really good. Yeah. Really good, most of the time. We uh, had uh, barbecue pits in our squadron at Da Nang, uh, right outside the, the, the squadron building. We had a small building where the squadron, each squadron had its own building. Uh, and you had an operations building with offices and planning and things like that. And then a quarters right next door. Uh, between the quarters, we had this barbecue pit. We had sticks on the barbecue all the time. Uh, and there was a mess hall. If you went down there, they also had really good food. We didn't go there often because we would eat in the squadron most of the time. And this, at the at Uban, that wasn't the case. Uh, we went to the club to eat most of the time. And it was really good food. And I can't remember if they charged us, and they probably did, and didn't charge as much. Um, we didn't have real money, we had fake money uh, in, Tanah, in Vietnam. We called it MPC, I think, military something currency. Um, but we used real dollars when we were in, in Uban. In any event, it didn't, didn't amount to much. How did you deal with the pressure and the stress of being a combat fighter? Didn't 
you know, they teach you really well that you are so good that you're not going to get hurt. And so there isn't, uh, there is some stress, obviously. Um, and uh, but there is very little fear. Uh, there is some fear. And there's always some humor. So, I don't know how you deal with it. Sometimes you don't deal with it as well as others. There's alcohol. That's a good reliever. You know, short term, on a short term basis. But you can't fly on over. So you can't use a lot of alcohol. Was faith important to you during that time? It wasn't. It is now, but it wasn't then. Did you have anything that you carried for good luck? No. Um, not wasn't then, and I'm not now. Superstitious. At your base, did you have USO shows in the club or? At Da Nang, you know? we did. Uh, in Vietnam, I don't remember any at at uh, in Thailand, but in Vietnam we did. And, uh, uh, Bob Hope actually came one time when I was there. I don't know, it was just must have been just after Christmas. Um, but I do remember he was there and there was crowds of people. Um, and I I can't remember if I actually got to see the show. I don't think I did. But he did come. Did you pull any pranks on your fellow airmen? Oh, I can't remember. Probably did. I don't I don't remember that. Can you recall the day when you left the States? When you were done or when you returned from Vietnam or Thailand? And also when you separated from the military. Well I'm trying to think of something significant. I can't even remember. Uh, getting off the airplane. Now the first tour ended uh, on an emergency leave. I was sent home because my uh, it was thought that my mother was going to die, and she was in a military hospital in Colorado Springs. Um, and it was so close to my rotation date that they said, "Don't come back." Uh, so. Um, but my second one, I came back in mid to late August.